Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Mark Solomon, the National Campaign Director for Freedom to Marry. And I'm here today on behalf of the Respect for Marriage Coalition to welcome you to our press conference highlighting the depth and the breadth of amici, or friend of the court brief signers, in the Freedom to Marry and DOMA cases. This is a historic moment. Freedom to Marry and the Human Rights Campaign proudly co-chair the Respect for Marriage Coalition, which includes more than 80 organizations working to advance the Freedom to Marry and end the so-called Defense of Marriage Act. It includes the two legal organizations that are bringing these historic cases to the United States Supreme Court in March. The American Federation for Equal Rights, or AFER, is here, which has brought the Hollingsworth versus Perry suits, and the American Civil Liberties Union is here, which will argue the Windsor versus United States case. Those two groundbreaking cases will be heard on March 26th and March 27th. Another core member of our coalition is Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders, or GLAD. And in fact, we could think of no one better to MC today's press conference than Mary Bonato, the Civil Rights Project Director for GLAD. Mary has been a powerful leader in the marriage movement for many years, winning the historic Goodrich case in 2003, which made Massachusetts the first state in the country to have the freedom to marry. Mary also brought the first case challenging the Defense of Marriage Act in federal court, and she's been working with the ACLU on the Windsor case. She knows how important today's participants are in representing some of the main cornerstones of both of these cases. Mary? Thank you, Mark. I want to thank all of you for being here today. I am honored to introduce this prestigious group of groups and individuals uh, who really represent people across the nation who are committed to ending DOMA's discrimination and supporting the freedom to marry. And obviously all of these folks represent people who are filing amici briefs, uh, sharing their expertise so the court can make the right decisions. I also want to give my own tip of the hat, if I may, to Adam Umhafer, who is here from AFER, the sole sponsor of the Perry litigation, and to James Essex from the ACLU um, uh, in the Windsor litigation, and both of those folks will be available to answer specific legal questions about those cases. Uh, the deadline for filing friend of the court briefs, which is what brings us together here today, is today in the Perry litigation and tomorrow in the Windsor DOMA litigation. And we're here today to really demonstrate the deep and broad support on the issues. So we'd like to begin today's program uh, by hearing from Patrick Murphy, a former two-term member of the United States House of Representatives from Pennsylvania and a decorated Army officer. Congress Congressman Murphy was tireless uh, in the effort to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And joining him will be Captain Joan Dara, who served for nearly three decades as a Navy intelligence officer. Both Patrick and Joan have signed on to a military amicus brief. Congressman. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to be joined by Captain Dyer here. So you have two captains, uh, one Navy and one Army. We wore blue ties just for today together. Uh, but Mark, thanks for your leadership and, and to everybody being up here. Um, I'm going to make it uh, very brief and say th three quick things. One, uh, I had the honor to not just wear the cloth of our country over in Iraq as a captain with the 82nd Airborne Division, but I also taught the next generation of military leaders at West Point. And in the first day of class, we would teach them about what our Constitution meant and the fundamental principles such as equality, how all men and women are created equally in our country. And we fight and die for those principles. We all take an oath to support and defend that Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So it's my honor to join, to be a friend of the court, uh, to talk about how the Defense of Marriage Act, how DOMA hurts our military readiness because it splits military families. We treat different military members differently, whether or not they're gay or straight. And they're the same groups that even though they're married, they're treated differently when it comes to health benefits, when it comes to housing, 
when it comes to survivorship benefits, it's wrong. And it's very simple. You either believe in equality or you don't. You're either willing to fight for it or you're not. The champions here today are willing to fight for it. And I'm honored to stand with them shoulder to shoulder. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. And I, too, am honored to be here and, and be part of this. Um, I'm Joan Dara, and I retired uh, in 2002 as a Navy captain after serving for nearly 30 years. I am here today representing current and former service members who are seeking equal recognition and family support for their equal sacrifice in service in the U.S. Armed Forces. Going back a bit, on September 11, 2001, at 8.30, I went to the Pentagon for a briefing. I left at 9.30. At 9.37, American Airlines Flight 77 slammed into the Pentagon, killing seven of my coworkers who were in the briefing room that I had just left. At that time, I was a gay Navy captain with more than 28 years of dedicated military service. My partner, Lynn Kennedy, an openly gay reference librarian at the Library of Congress, and I had been together for over 11 years. In the days and weeks that followed, I went to at least seven, seven funerals and memorial services for shipmates killed in the Pentagon attack. As the numbness began to wear off, it hit me how incredibly alone Lynn would have been had I been killed. In fact, if I had been killed that day, Lynn would have been one of the last to know for under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, she couldn't exist. Since then, we've repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which is a very important step forward. At least now, our partners, spouses, and families no longer have to be hidden. But there is still much more to be done. The military is known for how it pulls together and helps its own. We talk about the military family, which is a way of saying we always look after each other, especially in times of need. But because of DOMA, Lynn and I and other gay service members are not full members of the military family. My spouse does not have the same legal rights as other spouses, despite the fact that we are legally married. DOMA requires the military to ignore legal same-sex marriages. As a result, the military cannot provide vitally needed benefits to spouses, including housing and health care, employment and education opportunities for family members, and burial and monetary benefits for surviving spouses. I am very proud to have served in the U.S. Navy, an organization I will always love and respect. And I commend Secretary Panetta for doing what he could within the constraints of DOMA. But it is not enough. All service members and their families must be treated equally. And ending DOMA is the only way that can happen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Congressman and, and Captain Dara. I'd like to welcome Michael Pease, uh, who leads Goldman Sachs Government Affairs Office here in Washington. Goldman Sachs signed on to a business brief, which now includes 278 of our nation's leading employers. Joining Michael will be Valerie Long, the Executive Vice President of the Service Employees International Union, which signed on to a brief in labor. So we have business and labor together. Michael and Valerie. Amazing. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> it can be done. And I didn't kick him. I did not. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here today on behalf of uh, Lloyd Blankfein and all the leadership at Goldman Sachs. Um, it's we are delighted to sign on to this brief. As you know, uh, our leadership at Goldman Sachs have been um, proponents of uh, of gay marriage uh, for a very long time and have been very public about that. Not only because we believe it's the right thing to do. Um, but because it's smart business and repealing DOMA is an important part of that. As you know, Goldman Sachs is a global business. We view attracting the best talent in the world as fundamental to our success. That includes our gay brothers and sisters and our gay colleagues. And we believe that using um, business as an instrument of discrimination with respect to benefits uh, is wrong. Uh, it undermines the ability to, to work in a place and feel comfortable there by not recognizing the families uh, of our employees. And we believe using business in that way needs to end, and it needs to end uh, with this court action. 
So uh, we are delighted to be here to uh, lend our voices as well uh, with many, many other companies. And we are delighted to be here with Labor and all the rest of you and hope this is an enormous step forward. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Valerie Long. I'm Executive Vice President of the Service Employees International Union. And I, I spoke to my nine-year-old granddaughter this morning who um, lives in Gaithersburg. And we often talk in the morning before she goes to school. And she says, Grandma, what are you doing today? I said, well, I'm going to this press conference to support gay rights. And she's like, oh, gays don't have rights? And I'm like, not enough. <laughs> she's like, well, that's not right. Yeah, you go and do that, Grandma. <laughs> so you know, it, it's simple in a lot of ways because we um, live in a society and we fight in the labor movement to protect people's rights and to make sure that workers aren't discriminated. If it could only be so simple that we could just stop discrimination dead in its tracks. But we have a long history in our country of having to struggle with it all the time. I am really proud to be in this room with so many people who care so deeply about um, civil and human rights. And on behalf of um, the Service Employees International Union, Change to Win, the AFL-CIO, the National Education Association, we represent the majority of unionized labor. And we come together to file the amicus brief in these cases for a simple reason. My granddaughter deserves to live in a society where things are fair, where gays and straights can live equally, and that people aren't screwed because of laws set up, like the Defense of Marriage Act, to um, discriminate against them. It's just not right. And we can um, do something about that. Um, these employment protections form a critical safety net upon which families rely for economic security once they retire or on the event of death, illness, injury, or disability. Denying same-sex couples these protections just um, isn't acceptable in a society where our kids and grandchildren are growing in a world that we think should be right for future generations. The um, DOMA codifies unequal treatment. Employers who extend health benefits to workers' families aren't required to do so for same-sex couples under the law. Even when they do, gay and lesbian workers don't receive the same tax benefits. One study by UCLA's Williams Institute estimates that the average employee receiving domestic partner benefits pays $1,000 more in taxes than are straight, married, or um, co-workers. Gay and lesbian married employees and retirees are denied Social Security survivor benefits. They can't receive tax benefits for contributing to a retirement account for a, a spouse. The protections that so many of us take for granted are not given to folks who we work with side by side. And our labor movement in um, everyday life tries to protect workers and make sure everybody is treated equally. Our members are working families of all sorts two parents, single parents, opposite and same-sex couples, and they, just like other working people, believe that the federal government should not financially penalize some workers simply because of who they choose to love. It is a basic fundamental right, and we feel very strongly that we'll prevail, and we also feel very strongly that we're in the right coalition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael and Valerie. Um, a key an absolutely critical ally in our journey to secure the freedom to marry has been the NAACP. And we are so pleased today to have Kim Keenan with us. Kim is the general legal counsel for the NAACP. She's an award-winning attorney, a lecturer at Georgetown Law School. And the NAACP joined a brief arguing that laws that distinguished based on sexual orientation are likely to be prejudicial and should be subjected to close judicial review. Kim? Hi. My name is Kim Keenan, and I'm the general counsel of the NAACP. I'm here today because for over 104 years, we have stood for the rights of all people, not just people of color, but all people. And when we step aside and say, oh, it's those people, or the people over there, but not really us, then we abdicate the rights for all of us. We are America. I think that's what always scares me about these kinds of, I just left the voting rights <laughs> yesterday, so you, I'm like, I, I keep thinking, am I waking up and I'm in some other country? Because I keep thinking I live in America. They keep telling me we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, and I do mean women and men, are created equal. But yet, we have laws that want to distinguish people on the basis of a status. And as we know at the NAACP, when you start distinguishing people based on status, you don't stop. You keep going. 
and you erode the rights that we've all, that we have parents of all different heritage is who fought so hard to make a reality. We like to send out that we are the beacon of freedom. We are the beacon of allowing individuals to become who they're going to become while still being a collective. But yet we would create laws that say, when you mourn your spouse, it's not the same as when I mourn my spouse. That's not the America that we created. And if we don't stand together when these things happen, then we don't stand at all. When our board voted to support marriage equality, it was the proudest day that I have had at the NAACP because it was such a, a provocative discussion. I almost wish I could have saved some of those arguments and had some people use them in closing because they really talked about, you know, if you look at the history of this country, when you start taking rights from some, it is inevitable that you will continue down this path. We know what history says, but we seem to sort of have a, a forgetting of what happened before, and we must not do that. We must stand together and make sure that all couples have the same rights, because we don't really have a good reason for them not to. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Gay and lesbian people and families are part of congregations in all faiths nationwide. Religious voices have been invaluable in this discussion that we're having as a nation. And the brief that we're about to talk about, the religious organization's brief, really demonstrates that there are a growing number of faiths and people of faith across the nation who support both the freedom to marry and an end to DOMA's discrimination against married couples. Our next two speakers, uh, signers on that brief, are Sandy Sorensen, who is director of the United Church of Christ Justice and Witness Ministries here in Washington, D.C., and also the Reverend Canon Scott Slater, who serves as the executive assistant to the Bishop of Maryland and spokesperson for the Episco Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. Thank you. Sandy. Good morning. Throughout its history, the United Church of Christ has been at the forefront in the struggle for justice and equality. Over the past 40 years, the General Synod of the United Church of Christ, which is our denomination's national deliberative body, has adopted resolutions affirming people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, consistently calling for an end to discrimination, calling for equal protection under the law, and supporting LGBT relationships and families, including the freedom to marry. We recognize and affirm that all of us are made in the image of God. And as children of God, each of us is endowed with dignity and worth that human judgment cannot set aside. As a Christian church, we believe love and compassion, justice and peace, are at the very core of the life and ministry of Jesus. It is a message that always bends toward inclusion. The language of covenant is central to the message of scripture concerning relationships and community. Countless same-sex couples in the United Church of Christ have made the choice to exchange vows and live together in the covenant of marriage. And many have become legally married in those places that have enacted civil marriage equality. The overall testimony of their lives and relationships attest to the blessing of God's abundance and life-giving power. In a nation that pledges liberty and justice for all, married, married same-sex couples deserve to be recognized equally under the law at every level, including the federal government. As a matter of justice, married same-sex couples should have equal access to the same institutional support, rights, and benefits that heterosexual married couples enjoy. DOMA denies same-sex couples and their children the federal rights and benefits of marriage, and in so doing, undermines the civil liberties of these couples and their families. The General Synod of the United Church of Christ unequivocally supports the freedom to marry for every citizen the General Synod of the United Church of Christ supports the position of the plaintiffs, agreeing with the lower court decision, striking down the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, 
I represent Bishop Eugene Taylor Sutton in the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. One of the roles of a bishop is to remind the church and the public at large of our Christian tradition of 2,000 years of moral and ethical reflection on matters of social concern. Before the election last November, Bishop Sutton issued a statement to every member of our diocese stating his support of marriage equality. He wrote, this is a divisive issue in our church as well as in the society at large. And Episcopalians, like all other people of faith, have a wide range of views about how same-gendered couples should be treated. In the church, we are struggling with Christian tradition and how we are to interpret scriptures on matters of sexuality. Clearly, our view of marriage has evolved over thousands of years since the time when women were considered property and a man could own as many of them as he could afford, either as wives or slaves. The Episcopal Church has been a leader in promoting civil rights for all people. Almost every Episcopal bishop of every diocese with an estate that has passed same-sex marriage legislation has signed on to support one of these amici briefs to strike down the Defense of Marriage Act. It is a matter of civil rights for our G GLBT brothers and sisters, and therefore a moral imperative to do what we Episcopalians say in our baptismal covenant to, quote, strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. For many of us, all of us, I hope, the bottom line is to do what is written in the book of the prophet Micah, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Will we do what the Lord requires of us on behalf of our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters, sons, daughters, nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles, cousins, parents, and grandparents? I hope so. It is time to act against this act. Thank you, Sandy and Reverend Canon Slater. Um, all of us who do this work uh, do it and remember every single day that we do it. The heart and soul of the issue is really the real people who are harmed by these inequalities and how it affects them and their families. And that's why I am so pleased to introduce now the Newbecker family who are joining us from Detroit and Chicago. Mike and Janice Newbecker are devout Christians whose son Lee is gay and is married to David. And David is with us today. They are also joined by their granddaughter, Braden, who has been very vocal on this issue. Mike and the family signed on to the PFLAG brief in support of the freedom to marry. Mike and your family. Good morning, and that saved me a little bit of introduction. Uh, also, my son, who, my son Lee Newbecker, who stands about two inches taller than myself, uh, he couldn't be here due to work. And my grandson, who stands right about the same height as Braden, I believe, Michael, he couldn't be here as well. But anyway, I'm here this morning uh, as a proud father of a gay son. When my son first came out, uh, because I grew up Catholic and was rather conservative and later United Methodist, I, uh, it seemed to be a conflict for me between the love for my son and the love for my faith. And uh, through some Bible study and the love of, for my son, it compelled me to get the facts and to, to uh, basically I reconciled the conflict and there's no longer a conflict. I love my son, my love for my son couldn't be stronger and love for my faith as well. I'm also part of a group called PFLAG, Parents, Families and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. Uh, it's a group of people, a lot of families, uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, people working together along with allies for equality. I met a lot of people in PFLAG and I signed on to this brief also knowing all the people that it helps besides just my own family. For me, a marriage, when I say that I've been married 41 years to my wife, I usually get applause if I'm speaking somewhere because there's that respect for marriage that's understood. Right away, they immediately know the relationship and what we mean to each other. I want Lee and David to have that same recognition when they say they're married. I'm gonna share a little bit with you uh, Braden's letter. She wrote a letter, and I'll just do a little bit of it. 
Uh, before I lived with my two dads, my life was horrible. My old family never treated me well. They wouldn't stand up for me. If my foster sister fought with me, my old mom would just sit there and watch me get hurt, so I would have to fight back. Each time I was at foster home, the foster parents promised me they would keep me safe and treat my brother and I equally, but they always broke their promise. I moved five times until my dad and daddy found me. They also promised that they would always love me and keep me safe and would treat me equal with my brother. When I was, I was four when I met them, now I am 10 and they have kept their promises. They do so much for me. They never hurt me or my brother. I feel so safe. I believe I can do anything with my two dads. Would there be any purpose to ban the marriage of two men or two women when they can treat children the same or even better than other couples? Uh, in our hearts, we know Lee and David are married. In their children's eyes, they're married. And uh, I just think it's time for the courts and the country and the government to recognize that fact that they're married. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Braden. Thank you to the whole family. It is appropriate to close with someone who represents the more than 100 Republicans who have signed on to a friend of the court brief, urging the court that gay and lesbian couples have a constitutional right to marry. Marriage, in fact, is, marriage in fact now is a bipartisan issue with more conservatives and more Republicans coming to see the sense and fundamental fairness of it every day. To speak directly to the growth of support is Jim Colby, a former 11-term congressman from Arizona. Congressman? Thank you, and thank you all for uh, being here. I, I know what it's like to be the cleanup batter, more appropriately perhaps, the, uh, <laughs> Uh, the guy at the end of the circus parade. Let's get it over done quickly and, and finish up here. So we will finish here. But it's a great honor and privilege for me to be standing with these people who mean so much to this struggle for civil rights for all people, uh, regardless of, of gender, regardless of their sexual orientation. There was a time when gay marriage seemed like just a, a, a vision so far in the future it didn't even seem possible. The most we could ever hope for was perhaps civil unions. But I think it's an indication of how the time has changed. And I want to acknowledge one of my colleagues in Congress who was with me during all of this time, Susan Molinari, executive with Google, who's here in all of these, these struggles. Uh, it is, it, times have changed. And I think now we recognize that civil unions don't, doesn't do it, that we need to have more. We need to have the full equality. I feel this rather personally. My partner is from Panama. Uh, he's been here for a number of years. He's a Fulbright scholar, master's degree in special education, uh, bilingual special education specialist. But our getting married does not permit him the right to immigrate to this country. And so our struggle to get immigration for him has been a long and a very a difficult one for him. And so it is with all the people that are standing here. It isn't just the individual stories we have to tell you, but each of us represents thousands of people and tens of thousands of people behind us who have similar stories, even more heartrending stories, heartbreaking stories. But times are changing, and I think we recognize that now is the time to strike and to make this change. I'm old enough, and there may be one or two others in the room that are old enough to remember when in half of the states of the Union it was not legal for a person of color and a Caucasian to be married, or a person of Asian extraction and a Caucasian to be married. You ask a young person about that today and they look like at you blankly as though, is that possible that that could have been the case? And I know and you know that in our lifetime and the lifetimes of most of the people in this room, it will become so that your grandchildren will come to you and say, you mean it was against the law for Uncle Harry and Uncle Frank to be married? And it will seem like something in the distant past. We're moving, we're getting there. 
The time is now to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congressman. And thank you to every single one of our speakers this morning. Uh, we trust that these speakers have demonstrated to you the breadth and depth of the support for marriage and for ending DOMA. Uh, and in March, the United States Supreme Court has the opportunity to fulfill that basic promise of securing equal justice under law for all Americans. And with that, I would like to now open this up for questions to our speakers. Really? <laughs> yes. We were so compelled. I understand that uh, current members of Congress, uh, current House Democrats, are also slated to file a brief in the Defense of Marriage Act case. I'm just wondering why they aren't participating here in the press conference. Can't have everybody. There, you know, there are. I think several dozen briefs coming in in both cases. And yes, you were right on Friday, uh, I think in the DOMA filing, there will be a brief of members of Congress and, and United States senators. And Friday will be the day to, to talk about that one. I mean, what you have here is really the tip of the iceberg, but in, you know, even here, with just a few of the briefs represented, you can see the depth and the breadth. But yes, there is another brief coming in. Do you know if congressional Democrats are gonna file a brief in the Proposition 8 case? Uh, I do not know. Yes. I have a legal question. <laughs> okay. Um, overturning the laws is agenda A. Also, is it going to be possible, though, to really establish the heightened scrutiny, which hadn't been done before? And then third, um, will this, the other side is saying this is going to be like the Roe v. Wade issue, and that if DOMA is overturned and Prop 8 is overturned, that all the other state laws are going to fall. Okay, well, that was kind of a big uh, big pitch there, but I'll take a shot at that uh, briefly, and I'll invite others to participate. With respect to the issue of heightened scrutiny and the standard of review, um, you know, this is the first time the United States Supreme Court will actually have the opportunity to really address the issue. It is squarely presented to them in both cases. There are no impediments to deciding the issue. There are records in the cases below this issue is there, and normally the, one of the first things you do when you're you know, reviewing a case on constitutional grounds is you decide the standard of review. So I have to say, as you will see from briefs coming in today and tomorrow, that there is a test. Uh, it's a pretty simple test. When you apply the factors in the test to discrimination against gay people, the test fits. You know, that's exactly what the NAACP is saying in the brief that it joined. Um, so frankly, the right answer, I think, is clear. What the court will do, the court will do, and we will find that out in June. Uh, with respect to if the court were to decide that heightened scrutiny applies, that the court has to look closely at laws that distinguish based on sexual orientation, uh, if they were to do that, then obviously it has profound reverberations because then any governmental action that singles out gay people has to be justified. The government has to say, why did it drag sexual orientation into the discussion? Why exactly are you saying gay people should be treated differently from everyone else? And those are fair questions to ask and for a, a governmental body to have to, an to answer. Do you want to add anything? Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, but can you make it explicit? Why should laws discriminate, oh, sure. discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation be subjected to high discrimination? Sure. There is a test. And the test has two key factors. One is there a history of discrimination against the group involved. And there will be briefs coming in from historians and the heightened scrutiny brief that's been referenced talks about the long history of discrimination. The Department of Justice Solicitor General has already um, written in the DOMA cases in particular about the federal government's participation in a history of discrimination against gay people and gay workers, driving them out of federal employment and so on. So there's a, a long history. It's been referred to in court opinions as well. The second key factor is, is there something about these people that justifies laws, um, dif you know, singling them out in some way? And the bottom line there is, you know, gay people participate in every walk of life as, you know, doctors and lawyers and uh, you name it. Um, every profession, their parents, um, community members, and there is nothing about sexual orientation that really justifies singling folks out. The pieces that... Um, the, in the litigation that folks uh, on the other side have focused on are the issue of, well, can't gay people just secure all their rights on their own? And the answer to that is no. Uh, 
or we wouldn't be in court right now. Uh, you know, laws like DOMA are a perfect example of how gay people are not able to protect their political interests. Uh, and the other issue that people sometimes focus on is, well, were you born this way? I, mean, I don't know any baby whose sexual orientation you can determine. Um, but having said that, the real issue for the court is, is this a, a distinguishing characteristic that somebody shouldn't be forced to change? Uh, and I think everybody recognizes, including the court and other opinions, that being gay or lesbian is a really very deep part of who you are, uh, and you shouldn't be forced to change it just to avoid discrimination. So there are going to be briefs coming in saying, here's the test, and it fits. Want anything? OK. So I think um, if there's no further questions, I want to just, again, thank everybody and thank our awesome speakers for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.